thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and before I talk, uh, I want to again thank Judy and Aaron and all their family and bless them for having this program and supporting it. And I think it's really an amazing program and really important to start at a young age. So I'm going to show you now a video just to give you an example of that. Um, we were a group of people in Hebron, which is uh, where, you know, Ma'arat is and where our fathers were buried. And Hebron is a huge Arab city. And Jews want to pray in Ma'arat HaMachpelah, but there was many, many terrorist attacks. So the Israeli army put soldiers around 1% of the city in order for Jews to be able to pray to a place that's been holy for them for thousands of years. And what happens is these peace activists and these, uh, and sometimes many, they could be even Israelis themselves, and I'll also talk about that a bit later, they come and they provoke the Israeli soldiers. And what we were seeing is that they were filming these provocative videos and they were trying to always upset soldiers. And we said, it doesn't help to just show them that they're wrong. We have to be on the attack. So we got together a few mothers of the, and fathers of these soldiers. We prepared them. And when these peace activists to yell at Jews, uh, to yell at the soldiers and, and yell at Jews who are going to pray and cursing them, we said, we are going to attack back. We're going to make them feel ashamed of what they're doing. And this is an example of how it looked like. Why are you not in Syria? Why are you not in Syria? Why are you here? Why do you come from Europe? Because here it's fun. It's democracy. It's you fun to be in Because we it. supply and we give more human rights than any other country in the Middle East. Why are you not in Iraq? Because you are a slave. Because you are an anti Semite. This is not Europe. You are a colonial and you need to be a slave. And you are hypocrites. And that's not bad. Is that enough? Go to Lebanon. And the reason I'm showing you this, and it's, it's kind of a shocking video, and, and, and your first feeling when you see this is, really, is this the right thing to harass these people? But at the end of the day, he's pointing out here a very important fact. Why are you focusing on Israel and not in any country in the world where human rights are violated in such a bigger way? In Syria, thousands of people are murdered every day. I served along Syria. I saw how they're bombing cities. In Lebanon, what's going on there? In Africa, there is so many examples of human rights. Now, it doesn't help to say it as a, as a saying, there's other people who do it, so why are you blaming us? But you, again, ask that question, why? Why are you only focused in Israel? Why is there only an anti-Israel group inside the campus? And at the end of the day, there is that simple truth about that there is a reason that people are focused in Israel. And the reason that people are focused on Israel is that it is a form of anti-Semitism because there's no other way to explain how there is one country who is dealing with terrorism and yes, and has many compli complicities and there's many things we have to deal with, but you will only see an anti-Israel group in the campus. You will see nothing about Syria. You will see nothing about what's going on in Africa where there's huge massacres that are unbelievable, but you will only see about Israel these certain things happening. And when you get that feeling, you have to remind yourself of this pride and this belief that you are doing the right thing and you are part of something big and it's not something that you have to feel apologetic for. It's not something that you have to be ashamed of. It's something that you have to be proud of and you have to explain yourself in the right way. And this is the last thing that I wanna talk about is one of the things that you're gonna be dealing also in, in college campuses is you're gonna be dealing with Jews who are supporting these Palestinian causes and who are supporting uh, who are support, you'll see Jews supporting justice for Palestine, or even Jews who are in these Palestinian groups. And many times that could demoralize you. You could ask yourself, well, what does that mean if there's Jews? I can't blame, blame them of anti I, I don't know where I stopped, but I wanna say that I didn't give you guys a lot of talking points and I didn't give you guys a lot of facts. And I did that purposely because I don't want to give you specific areas. And also, I'm sure this program has a lot of people who will give you information much better than I'll be able to do it. And I'm closer to your age and to what you guys are experiencing. But what I want to give you is just a sense as someone who grew up, who experienced firsthand also dealing with the Palestinians who have suffered from these peace activists and also who have experienced myself, my people from my own community who have suffered and who have been murdered from these certain experiences, 
that you have to prepare you guys mentally and really see it as a mental being if you believe in what you're representing. And when you come out there to college, you're proud and you're not explaining Israel. You're not trying to explain why Israel is the best in the world. And please, please don't talk about how Israel is the best in high tech and Israel invented a cure for Corona. The reason not, it's things that are important to talk about is because that's not what these people are attacking. It's not a real fight about is Israel good or bad. It is a hatred that cannot be explained towards who you are. And if you are proud of who you are, so you go out and attack. Just imagine that someone would go up to you and say something about your parents, about your family, something that was wrong. You wouldn't explain. You wouldn't say, no, my dad gives a lot of tzedakah and he's really a good guy and he helps a lot of people. You have no reason. You don't need to explain that. You say, who are you? How dare you talk about my parents like that? They are amazing people who do great things and I shouldn't try, I shouldn't need to explain to you who my parents are. It's the same thing with Israel. It's that pride and identity and also preparing yourself mentally to be fierce and to be strong that I think could really give you uh, those tools to do, do those specific things. And in the army, I was in a small unit and what we were in charge of doing uh, was detecting tunnels uh, entering Gaza. And I, before I'm gonna talk about uh, this whole process of detecting tunnels for a few minutes, I'll kind of say where my personal connection to these tunnels begin. So growing up in Gush Etzion in 2014, uh, three uh, teenagers that I knew personally uh, were kidnapped, um, hitchhiking back home. Um, and, and basically the army went on an operation to try to find these kidnapped teenagers who were your age. They were 16 and 17 years old. Unfortunately, at the end, uh, they found them uh, and they were murdered. Um, and, uh, and it was a real shocking experience. I was just in going into 12th grade. And right after that, uh, because the people who kidnapped were Hamas terrorists, an operation was started in the Gaza border, an actual war. Um, and that's the first time that I experienced, not as a soldier, but as a citizen, what this means, tunnels. So I'm going to show you guys a quick video to give you an idea um, of what's the danger of a tunnel um, and what people could do with it. Um, so I'm just going to upload here. One minute. And I'm showing you now a live video. These are terrorists who put on themselves a GoPro camera and they actually film themselves leaving a tunnel that's going from in Gaza and going into Israel. So you're seeing now actual footage of terrorists who film themselves coming out of a tunnel. So here they're at the real exit area of the tunnel and they're climbing outside. As you can see, they have weapons. And very quickly, in a 20 minute run, they're able to exit Gaza. And here they're already inside Israel territory and they're running towards the kibbutz. Kibbutz is a small town with some women and children living. And they're actually something like, I would say 300 feet away from a kibbutz when they come to this army post. Um, and you're seeing this all live. What's going on here? Um, and I'm going to stop the video now, but basically in this operation, they were able to enter this base, uh, unfortunately murder Israeli soldiers, um, and we were able to stop them just before they got to a kibbutz where women and children were living. Um, but this just gives you a first example. Um, as a young teenager growing up, when people are talking about Palestinians and Israel, a simple truth about how this is not a war and it's a way and it's a scheme in which people uh, are trying to find the most artistic ways and the most interesting ways to try to kill Israelis. Uh, and it's nothing about hand-to-hand -hand combat, but very secret and, and, and difficult ways uh, of finding tunnels. I joined the army and our unit, we were 10 people and we were in charge of taking very sophisticated technologies and with these technologies, detecting tunnels. Throughout my service, we found 25 terror tunnels. Most of these terror tunnels were coming out inside civilized areas. Um, so just to give you an idea of what's the threat of a tunnel, usually when we would find a tunnel, we wouldn't just find one. 
but the tunnel would split off into separate areas. And usually there would always be one tunnel that would come right outside a civilian place, meaning it would come outside uh, a school, it would come outside a residential building. And usually we would find right next to it another tunnel that would be on top of a hill that would control the road going into that civ civilized area. And what would happen is basically if they would ever, God forbid, be able to do their operation while many terrorists would come out and try to attack a town or some or a civil civilian area the other tunnel they would control the high point and any sort of soldiers that would try to come and rescue these civilians they would be stopped and again this is a very important thing to understand because many times what do we hear when people are talking about israel and palestinians we always hear one word and that's conflict and when you say conflict, you imagine two groups who are clashing against each other. Now, in many ways, you could say that that's true. In many ways, you could say that's right. It's Israelis and Hamas, and they're fighting each other. But this isn't a conflict. It isn't two armies and two enemies who are trying to hurt each other. It's a situation in which there is one group of terrorists in a very clear way who say it themselves, who want to hurt civilians and plan in a very efficient way how to do it. And, it, and that's all I did in my army service. I never dug a tunnel. I never thought about how I could blow up another house. All my service and all my efforts were you put into one thing, how to detect these tunnels. And when we would look for these tunnels, we would put so much effort and we would put so much money and we would risk our lives in so many ways. And always people would ask us the simple question. They would always say, why don't you, we would, why don't you just bomb where they're digging the tunnel from? Because we always knew where they were digging the tunnel from. But we always said we can't dig the tunnel from because we know that that tunnel, that above that tunnel, they're digging it from a residential area. They're digging it from a place that people live. So just to give you an idea um, of, of where they dig tunnels, this was a house that we found, we knew that they were digging a tunnel from. We knew it for three years that they were digging a tunnel from. We were never able to find um, them. We were never able to find them. Uh, and usually what happens is when we detect a tunnel and we, destroy, we decide to destroy the tunnel, so we stream huge amounts of cement. We stop all the cement supply of Israel uh, for one day. We bring usually around 350 trucks of cement and we start streaming cement inside the tunnel in order to block it. So you're going to see a video now of what happens when that cement uh, shoots out of the house where they're digging the tunnel from. So these are two people who live in the house and suddenly they see a huge stream of cement starting to pour out from the house. Um, here, I actually got in trouble from this. I miscalculated the amount of cement we needed. So it kind of over went over, all over the place and into the town. Um, but you'll see soon how much cement is coming out. But this is, again, this is a situation we we're dealing with in completely civilian areas. The enemy were digging tunnels from, they were working on finding these different places. Um, and, uh, and working from there uh, in, order, in order to dig it and make it much more difficult for us to do it. Um, in many operations that we went inside, uh, we basically we didn't know what we were waiting for because we weren't able to do anything and suddenly they would come out of one building and another building and we would never know where they were coming from. And again, that's the situation that we were dealing with uh, and we had to uh, go around with. So a few things. First of all, I think we also have to differentiate. I think there'll be a lot of people who will want to have conversations with you. And then you could really have just a good conversation. But always remember the word why. Like, always go back. When you go back enough, it's just so easy to explain. Like, why did they bomb that house? Why did they bomb that house? Why did that war begin? Like, I always tell people, why did they bomb that house? Because 20 hours late, earlier... 700 rockets were shot at a civilized area with thousands of civilians living in it. What would you do? That's another thing. But as you said, if people will actually be attacking you, so I'll tell you something interesting that they do in the Israeli army when they train, uh, when they train girls, and they train girls to deal sometimes with um, sexual harassment or things like that. As I was saying in training in the army, so they teach you to yell. So, um, you know, I was also hearing Jack speaking is, I think that... Um, one of the things that like that may, many times instinctively is going to happen to you is you're going to kind of go tense. You're going to feel like you have to protect yourself. But 
always kind of train your head. And this is why they just like, it's actually a whole hour where you'll hear everyone yelling. Like they're actually yelling is always put in your head that when someone comes up to you, you're not protecting yourself. You're, you're on attack and you're representing something and you're, and, and you're straight on attack and it will, it will change the mindset. And as Jack said, like ask them the hard questions, like, who are you to come? First of all, who are you to come and question me just because I'm a Jew and I support the country that represents my people. So you could target me and you could say to me things like that. Like, first of all, everything that you believe in, like you are completely violating right now when you're presenting it. And especially when you're not like, why are you coming to me? How about you go to this, to this Syrian over here? How about you go to this African? Would you go to an African and say, why is there a massacre going on in Congo? If you knew there was a student from Congo, like, how dare you? And, and go and ask him their high questions and then say, and if he says, oh, you're not willing to answer me, say, oh, I would be happy to answer you. If you're willing to sit down and actually look at facts and have a conversation, but I will have no conversation where you're attacking. If you're curious about Israel, maybe. I'm interested to talk to you about Israel and maybe not, but make sure that you put in that point in that way. I'll finish with a, a song that Nathan Alterman, who was a Zionist leader, uh, wrote. Um, and I'll, I'll try to translate it in my head quickly into English, but he says he wrote it right after the 48 war when Israel won the Arab armies. And it goes like this. It says, thus says the saint and this enemy, how could I win him? He has the bravery, he has the weapons and he has, uh, and he has the courage. How will I be able to do, how will I be able to win him? Thus the saint and said, I will not fight him. I will demoralize him and he will forget that justice is within him. Our biggest danger is not the Hamas and it's not the terrorists, is that if we as Jews, we forget that the justice is with us. And when we believe strongly that we are on the right side of this and that justice is within the Jewish people who are coming back to their homeland, we'll be able to deal with all the rest. I want to show you guys a bit more, go a bit deeper into what I'm talking about. So in elite units in the army, we have something that is called Krav Maga training. And in Krav Maga training, what happens many times is when you guys hear Krav Maga, what do you imagine the training looks like? I can tell you that me as a young soldier, when I just joined the army and I, they told me that there was going to be Krav Maga training, I got really excited. I was sure I was going to be the next Chucky Chan. I would know all these cool moves. I would know to move really quickly. I even told my mom I might be able to do a flip in the air by the end of it um, and beat Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. That's kind of the way I imagined it. And what happened in the first year of, uh, of this Krav Maga training um, is the first year in elite units in the army of Krav Maga training, they are just beating you up. Meaning you come, you're woken up, and people are just hitting you. And what is the reason that they do that? Why is the reason that the first year of training, they don't teach you one move and they don't teach you one skill set and all they teach you is how to be hit. And the reason is, is that many times you could learn theoretically a lot of situations and many times you could deal with a lot of situations that are very difficult. You could learn a lot of ways to deal with it theoretically, but if you don't experience them on yourself, you'll never really be able to deal with them. And that's why a lot of times people say when you learn martial arts and you learn that when someone goes like this, you go like that. And when someone goes like this, you go like that. You'll never be able to win a street fight because you don't know what it means to have that fierceness and going at it. And the reason I'm saying this to you guys is that there is so much history and there is so much facts that you guys could learn and they are extremely important to learn and you have to prepare yourself. Also in the Israeli elite units in the army, at the end of the day, they train you in certain moves and certain skill sets, but not before you change the mentality. And I think that that's one of the most important things for you guys to understand. If I talked before about changing from explaining yourself to being on attack, this is the next thing. You have to prepare yourself that you, a lot of times when you're gonna to come to these college campuses, Hopefully you'll be having a civil conversation and you'll be able to talk to them. That will be great. You'll be able to show them facts. You'll be able to talk to them all about, but many times you're going to be yelled at, you're going to be attacked and you're going to be harassed. And when that happens, 
it doesn't help just to learn what is the right answer. When someone says to you, you're a child murderer, what do you answer to someone like that? When someone says to you, you're murdering thousands of innocent babies and children, that's a lie. But how do you deal with that? Do you show the numbers? Do you say, well, look at this spreadsheet and actually Israel hasn't killed any civilians around these years or look at this number, it doesn't show. That's not how you act like that. And I think that one of the things that you want to prepare yourself, and I would even say practice with your friends, is how do you give another fierceness? How do you show back what you believe in, what you represent? How do you go straight into the attack? And it's a mentality trick. And it's a way that you switch your mindset and you go straight into understanding. And I had a few instances where people would come up to me and they would say something about anti-Israel. And I would say to them, listen, how dare you? How dare you a nation that for thousands of years dreamt of this piece of land and the ideology, the Palestinian nation is based on ideology that was connected to the Nazis, that believed and said out first and out most, we are going to destroy the Jewish people and we're going to finish Hitler's job. And that is an idea that you represent today. And especially, and this is another thing, is I know Palestinians. And the people who are suffering the most from these peace activists are the Palestinians themselves who just want to live next to Israelis, but always these Peace activists are supporting these radical leaders who are hurting them. How dare you talk in the name of Palestinians? How do you know what they want? But you have to go into this fierceness and you have to really believe in yourself in order for this to happen. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and before I talk, uh, I want to again thank Judy and Aaron and all their family and bless them for having this program and supporting it. And I think it's really an amazing pro program and really important to start at a young age. Um, if you look back at Jewish history, Jewish youth have been the leaders of change in the Warsaw Ghetto Revolt and the founding of Israel. So this isn't only preparation, this is, you're already up to the challenge. So I'm really happy about that and I really believe in this cause. Um, and I want to talk today about my, I'm going to start with my personal story and just walk you through uh, where I come from and my experience in the army. But through these specific experiences, I want to share with you my thoughts and different points that I think are very important when you go to college, talking about college uh, activism and representing Israel. And also certain methods that they teach us in elite units in the army that I think could really help you guys when you get to college and you'll be facing anti-Semitism and anti-Israel uh, advocacy inside, uh, inside the campuses. So I'm 23 years old. Uh, both of my parents are from Los Angeles. Uh, they made Aliyah and I was born in Israel, but that's where my English is from. Some people don't believe me, I'm Israeli. I have to convince them, tell them where the best hummus in Israel is in some corner street, but then they believe me. Um, and I was born in a small town called Gush Etzion. Um, Gush Etzion is right near Jerusalem, um, and I grew up in this, in this area, a, amazing town, amazing area. I was surrounded by Arabs who were good friends of ours, um, and it was always shocking to me when people from all around the world would talk about these poor Palestinians who were actually my day-to-day -day friends and who hated and didn't like people talking about them from outside and thinking they'll represent them, but that's, I'm not going to be talking about that. Um, at age 18, I went to yeshiva. I studied in yeshiva in Otniel, did that for a few years, and then I joined the army. So I want to, purposely, I want to talk about the situation in Gaza, not because I think that it's important specifically to talk about Gaza, um, but I want to take the Gaza story as an example of how you deal with Israel advocacy. So when you see this photo, what does it look like? This is a great photo. You see men and children, you see people that don't have weapons, you see people that look completely civilized, and they're standing in front of a bob-wired gate and an army position. And it looks like all they wanna do is their freedom. And what you guys are gonna be dealing with in college campuses and universities are pictures. You're not going to be dealing with a list of facts. No one's going to be giving you a piece of paper that says these are the facts about Israel. These are the facts about uh, Palestinians. People are going to be showing pictures and pictures are so easy to to change around and pictures are so easy to manipulate. 
So before I go in inside the situation of what you're actually seeing, I want to show you another picture just to show you the absurdity of this picture. So in this picture, I took this picture from, his, from where I live, looking on to his, a Hamas outpost. Now that little outpost that you see, that white outpost, that's a Hamas outpost. Now what's important to know about this, that Hamas is a military organization that controls Gaza, um, and they're a terrorist group. And they have a few army branches. They have a police, they have an actual fighting force, but their biggest army branch is the army branch that is in charge of protecting the border. Now, why are they in charge of protecting the border? Are there any Israelis who are trying to get into Gaza? No, there aren't any Israelis who are trying to get in. They want to make sure that none of the Gazans leave Gaza because they know that the minute that people from Gaza who are suffering so much from this di dictatorship rulership are trying to leave the territory, so it will cause panic among the people and it would hurt them. So if we go back again to this photo, and you're gonna to go to campuses and people are gonna to say to you, there is a blockade on Gaza. People are not letting Gazans leave. And the simple truth about it is that at the end of the day, the people who most want this blockade and most don't want the people to leave are Hamas themselves. And they are the, peop and they are the ones who are scared most about, about these people getting close. Now, I experienced these kinds of protests many times. I'll explain what they are. Hamas, who's trying to gain support around the world, which you'll see in Israeli campuses, they want to do these events for one reason, because you could take great photos from these events. And basically what they organize is they organize every Friday, they bring thousands of Gazan citizens, forcing them to come, meaning it's not something that they come voluntarily. They're poor in Gaza, buses come, offer them money, basically push them into the bus to come and protest. And you'll see a huge gathering of people. And then you'll see that there are people who are controlling how close you could get to the gate. And they're sending off people to try to provoke Israeli soldiers. And what happens is that they're all dressed as civilians. They're all dressed as people who don't look like they're terrorists, but suddenly they could pull out a grenade, suddenly they could pull out a gun and they could throw it at you. And I had a lot of instances where I was lying on these mounds of dirt, like you could see there, and suddenly a grenade blows up right next to you. Now, what do you do? You're lying there right in front of you and you see a lot of civilians all around you. And you know that there's people that are throwing a grenade on you. Your life is in danger. What do you do? What is the right situation that you deal with? So just to give you an example of how Israel deals with these situations, on our guns, they put these special scopes that were cameras. And Israel was so scared that we would by mistake shoot someone, not justifiably, not for the right reason, that we weren't allowed to shoot if our cameras weren't working. Meaning this situation is not an actual war. It's not an actual area where someone is really trying to accomplish something. It's a media war. It's a way in which people are trying to provoke Israelis and trying to get enough good pictures in order to do it. Just for example, uh, our unit, we were in a certain area. And just when we were there, uh, Hamas claimed that a medic was killed. And we were all uh, interrogated. The Israeli army wanted to understand what was going on and what happened. And basically what happened is that from the rocks and the tear gas that they were shooting, this medic was killed, meaning they killed their own medic, but they tried to blame Israel for it. So it's all a game and it's all a show in order to try to show Israel in a certain light. But the reason it's important for me to say it and the reason also specifically, I'm not giving facts and I'm not giving you all the information is that I think that the story in the Gaza border is exactly a representation of what you're gonna be dealing with on college campuses. And the thing is, is that when you're gonna be coming to college campuses, and as I said, and people are gonna to be presenting in front of you photos, and there are photos. There's photos of buildings that have been destroyed, and there's photos of children that are killed. There are many, many photos. And some of those photos aren't lies. But when you're gonna be dealing with these photos, and you're gonna be asked to give the facts. So you have to ask yourself the question, if you wanna now try to explain everything that's going on, and what happens many times is that people see this photo, which could be a very shocking photo, and people are very shocked to see it. And the way we, we initially we wanna react is we wanna explain the situation. No, it's not really like that. 
And it's because Israeli, you know, Israeli soldiers are doing everything they can not to hurt civilians, which is true. And that Hamas is provoking Israelis to do it, which is true. And Israelis are only allowed to shoot if they see a direct threat of their life and they would never shoot randomly, which is also true. But when you're on the defense and when you're always trying to explain every situation, every bullet that was shot, every building that was taken down, you will never be able to win that kind of argument because it's an emotional argument. And people are seeing a photo of women and children suffering and they're relating. And they're seeing you guys who are trying to explain and justify it in an intellectual way. And that is something that could be very dangerous because at the end of the day, if you want to throw facts at people who are blaming you and are accusing you, when you answer and when you try to explain yourself, many times you're accepting the accusation. There's a reason why when people go to court, the judge has to decide if there's even a case. The judge has to make a, a justification that certain questions should even be put in front of the judge. Certain things should be put. And I think that one of the most important things that for you guys to understand, and as a soldier who has dealt with these certain situations, is that certain cases you don't want to be on the defense. You, I could give you a lot of facts here about how I was many times close to death just because people were throwing at us a grenade and there was a little child or a woman standing in front of us. But that's not the, the real story that I should be talking about. When I talk to people about the Gaza border, I talk to people about history, about the fact that Gaza used to be a heaven, about it used to be a main port for people. And always I ask the question, and I think this is one of the most powerful words that you could put in front of anyone, why? Why is this the situation? Why is there a blockade on Gaza? Why are they protesting? Why are we seeing these photos? And when you go into Israeli history and you force people to answer the question why, not just deal with what they're doing, you realize that why is because Hamas is a dictatorship who executes many people of different things. It executes gays, it executes anyone who doesn't agree with it, it executes people of other religions, it takes apart churches inside its country, and at the end of the day, it's controlling, and, it, and the only way it's able to justify itself is by fighting Israel. And Hamas is a terrorist organization that when it shoots rocket, and I live, and I'll soon talk about the different communities, it shoots hundreds of rockets towards kindergartens and towards schools and towards places that people live in. And when, I, when people come to me and they say, how could you be an Israeli soldier? I answer them and I say, how could you justify supporting a terrorist organization that aims rockets at women and children? How could you justify that while I risked my life just not to hurt a woman or a child, those same organizations put women and children right in front of them in order? I go straight to the attack. I don't try to explain myself. I don't need to give an explanation. They have to give me an explanation. They have to give me an explanation why they're supporting ideas that those ideas represent terrorist organizations. Why are there people, why is there a blockade on Gaza? There, there, was, there wasn't always a blockade on Gaza, ask them. What made it that there would be a blockade on Gaza? When you look in the Gaza border, there was many crossings that people could go in and out. There was the, the Carney crossing is one of the most famous ones. Why did they close the Carney crossing? Because every week there is a suicide bombing inside the Carney crossing. And that's exactly something that we have to change in our mentality is that when you come and when you are trying to explain different situations and you're trying to explain, but if you go out there and you go to the origins of why are we dealing with what we're dealing with, you'll find a very simple truth that's a very powerful one. And I think that that's first and foremost one of the most important things that I could kind of give you guys and suggest you guys. You're going to experience many times Jews that are um, who are uh, who are supporting these Palestinian causes and who are in these boards of student students for justice for Palestine or even there's whole organizations of Jews supporting Palestine. And just what it was important for me to say is don't let that demoralize you, um, because throughout history we've been dealing with uh, we've been dealing with Jews who have who have gone against what the Jewish people needed from leaving Egypt, meaning there's a whole discussion, but it basically most of the Jews didn't leave Egypt. It was a small percentage in Mount Sinai and throughout the desert and the Holocaust. Jews have, just because people were Jews never meant that they knew what was good for the people of Israel. 
and you shouldn't let that demoralize you. You could just, it just proves to you that this is something, it's a continuing, every generation, people are coming and trying to attack us. And this is another example of that. It's nothing different. And in every generation, unfortunately, we also have Jews who support those causes, but that in no means ways that that should unjustify. And we deal with Israelis who support BDS. We deal with Israeli professors who support doing boycotting Israel, as crazy as that sounds. And we have to deal with them inside Israel. The situation isn't much better in Israeli universities. So um, just remember that. So, I mean, I just finished the army, um, and, but um, I just, I truly believe, like, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this way. When I was a little kid, I was kind of bummed out I was born in this generation. I always felt that if I was born in the founding of the state of Israel, it would be much cooler. I'd get to fight the British soldiers. And, um, but then you realize that, you know, you read Jewish history and it's been teenagers. Like, I, like if I would have been in the founding of the state of Israel at age 23, I would already be an old, an old person. Like, the Warsaw Ghetto, you could read descriptions of 13-year-old girls running with grenades in their pockets, fighting Nazi soldiers. And I just really believe that, you know, that this young age is the key to really influencing and doing great change. That's why I also really believe in this program. Um, and I'm really passionate about people our age um, and especially teenagers doing that. <laughs>